So it's Halloween, and you know what that means. It's spooky season. So we're going to look at the fossil history of a group of animals that at least my wife finds really, really terrifying. And that's because I think whip scorpions and vinegaroons are wildly interesting. They're so cool, but my wife just, she's made very uncomfortable by their general appearance. And to be fair, some of them do look pretty threatening, like Mastigoproctus giganteus, or the giant vinegaroon, which I first saw when I was just a wee lad living in southern Arizona. And when I saw it, it was actually on the playground at school, in one of those little water meter covers, or under the cover at least. And that actually leads into some of how they lived and why some of their adaptations are the way they are, and also why that makes them look so terrifying to some people. The thing is though, despite being so threatening looking, they're really not that threatening. In fact, they have a chemical defense because they're not that threatening. I mean, a raccoon is still gonna eat you, even if you look scary and you're that small of a bug. But most vinegaroons can actually spray a vinegar-like substance or acetic acid out of that long tail. And that's a really great defense mechanism because most animals don't know how to deal with chemical defenses very well. And we unfortunately don't have a lot of evidence of when that first started in the fossil record, but we do have some good fossils to start helping us understand how they became what they were, with those first fossils coming from the Carboniferous over 300 million years ago. There's Paragerilinura and Prothelifonus from Europe, as well as Gerilinura, which has been found in North America, Europe, and China. And the fossils of this animal coming from the Maison Creek, the same kind of formations that famous fossils from the Carboniferous, like Tully Monstrum are found in, actually does a lot to help inform us about how they were at the beginning. You can already start to see some of those major adaptations that the whip scorpions, both the tailed and the tailless whip scorpions, are known for today. And that means first we need to understand what the whip scorpions are, and they're chelicerates, which mean they have specialized feeding appendages. The most famous versions of these are actually the things and spiders, but you can also see some of them in things like camel spiders, which have more scissor-like chelicerate, and they use that to help chop up food. Again, it's specialized for feeding. And you can actually even go more back to the pincer-like ones that occur in things like horseshoe crabs. It's very consistent, and they do change a lot throughout the group, but they are specialized for feeding, and that is consistent. And so what are these on things like the vinegaroon? Well, it's not the big pincers. Those are actually pedipalps, which I'll get into. Instead, the chelicerae are much smaller in things like the whip scorpions. They're more specifically used to chop up the food once it's already caught by the pedipalps. Now, the pedipalps, in this case, have large claws. You can think of it very similarly to actual scorpions. However, in things like spiders, the pedipalps are actually just these kind of little legs that hang in front and they don't actually walk on. And in some of these Maison Creek fossils, you can actually see that pretty well. You can really see how the pedipalps are separate from the chelicerae, and how even early on in their evolution, they were already homing in on a body plan that worked out pretty well and was pretty stable for them. And now I'm going to jump away from the vinegaroons, the long-tailed whip scorpions, and jump into the tailless whip scorpions. Because they actually, at least some of them, show one of the main features of vinegaroons and their relatives really, really well and that's antenniform legs. You can actually look at this in the genus Daemon, which has really, really long antenniform legs. And when we're considering what this means, we need to understand that these are arachnids. They should have eight legs, but they only walk on six, and that's because some of these legs actually turned out to evolve into a form that's pretty antenna-like. In general, vinegaroons and their relatives live in very dark, damp places. Think about that water meter that I mentioned before. And that means they really can't see very well. But having antenniform legs that actually reach out further in front of the body means they can kind of feel around. And that means they're better adapted to actually try and live in these environments because the general darkness is easier to know what's going on if you can actually feel what's going on. Unfortunately though, like other arthropods, the exoskeleton of the whip scorpions is made up of chitin, which doesn't really phosphatize well. Essentially, it doesn't get replaced by phosphorus very easily, and that's how we get a lot of our fossils, which also then means we don't have a lot of fossils of them, especially from when you're considering where they would have lived, in equatorial places, especially when we're considering those carboniferous fossils, which were very much along the equator, at least at that time. Unfortunately, this means that it's really, really hard to try and get fossils of the antenniform legs because they're so long and spindly that there's really not a lot of material there to mineralize and actually get preserved in the fossil record. Additionally, the whole thing is made out of that chitin, so we really don't have a lot of fossils of the whip scorpions in general. 
In fact, from what I found, there's basically the Carboniferous ones and then some in the Cretaceous. So almost a 200 million year gap between the first ones and the next ones. Just huge, huge gap. However, a lot of times these are still coming from relatively warm places. During the Carboniferous, all of those fossils would have been pretty close to the equator. And the continents during the early part of the Cretaceous were at least somewhat close to where they are today, at least as far as latitude is considered. So we can look at the Crato formation in Brazil, and we can see that there's actually one fossil from here of a tailless whip scorpion that is preserved. And while the antenniform legs weren't preserved, you can see the pedipalps. And the thing with the tailless whip scorpions is they're actually much more like grasping claws, almost like a praying mantis, as opposed to pincing claws like they are in scorpions and in the tailed whip scorpions. So there is some different biology going on there. And in this fossil, Bertopygus wigolti, you can see the pedipalps being very, very widely spread out. So it was definitely, or at least almost definitely, one of these tailless whip scorpions. And the fossil isn't great, but again, this is another formation that's known for really, really great preservation, the same way that Mason Creek is. And in fact, in this same formation, you have some pterosaurs that actually preserve soft tissue. So it does make sense that at least on occasion, we would get incredible preservation of arthropods in this formation. And we do, fortunately. And then there's another time period about 15 million years later where we have a few more other fossils of whip scorpions. These ones though come from Myanmar, and I have an entire video on the Burmese amber that comes from Myanmar and some of the ethics surrounding that. But for this paper, we're really just looking at the one organism they found, which was a tailed whip scorpion and importantly, falls into a group that already exists. Mesothelephonus parvus is from the subfamily Heliphoninae. And there's a lot of very minute details that I'm not totally familiar with because I don't work on arthropods that really help to differentiate the modern subfamilies of the whip scorpions. But importantly, this subfamily, where is it distributed today? In Southeast Asia. So this shows that this subfamily has been in Southeast Asia for at least the last 100 million years. And they've been pretty consistent about just living their best lives and making it through even very devastating climatic events, such as the extinction that killed off the non-avian dinosaurs because they were there before and they were still in those same areas afterwards. And there's actually some relatives from Burmese Amber that are potentially even more interesting. And we're actually gonna be looking at Chimera arachne, which the arachne is from arachnid, but also means it's probably closer to spiders. And there's a few features that show this, namely spinnerets, so it was able to make silk, which is pretty straightforward. But also you can see more fang-like chelicerae. However, it importantly still had a somewhat long tail, much like the vinegaroons do today. So what does this mean overall for this group? Well, potentially that Chimera arachne was some kind of stepping stone in evolution, essentially, First, you would have had things like the vinegaroon start to evolve, and then a separate branch would have come off, evolved into something like Chimera arachne, and then another branch would have come off and evolved into the spiders. And the thing is, that means that Chimera arachne isn't quite a spider, but isn't quite a vinegaroon. And again, it is probably closer to the spiders, but that just means that there was another entire group of arachnids that did really, really well, because that means this lineage that led to Chimera arachne would have needed to evolve by about the time the first spiders and the first whip scorpions started to show up. And that means that lineage was successful for 200 million years, like I mentioned, where these fossils are 200 million years later than the first fossils of them. But whatever Chimera arachne is and how exactly it fits into the arachnid tree of life, we can't tell because they're extinct now. And so despite that 200 million years of success, there's none left. And what that really means is we need to consider that although things like the whip scorpions seemingly have been super unchanged for millions of years, that there's still a lot that we don't understand about why certain groups may or may not go extinct. And especially in the face of climate change, that could be bad for them because they, again, are pretty much only at the equator. And that means they really like those humid environments and we don't exactly know how those might develop in the future. So what this means is that Chimera arachne and its relatives were successful for 200 million years at least. And that essentially we really can't take for granted that even things that undergo very small changes, such as vinegaroons, aren't gonna go extinct at some point. And that would suck because vinegaroons and their relatives are just so interesting because they're not quite spiders and they're not quite scorpions. They fit somewhere in between, but then took an entirely different trajectory evolutionarily. And so it would be really, really tragic to lose out on this really interesting group, even if it does have a really poor fossil record.